There seems to be plenty of articles and videos floating around regarding the current state of RTS. Some of them raise some good points, but I don't entirely agree with their conclusions. The general through line is normally that RTS was once very popular and a lot of games were released, and that it's now less popular, not many games get released, and those that do, fail. However, a lot of RTS's popularity in the early days was grossly inflated by StarCraft. StarCraft was hugely popular in the 2000s, and this would have greatly inflated the market share of RTS. And, as a result, it would have got more attention than it deserved and the industry would have released far more titles because of this. But StarCraft was a cultural phenomenon and not representative of the genre as a whole. It's like Adidas. During the 80s, the successful Russian Olympic team was given Adidas tracksuits, and those clothes became hugely popular with the Russian population as a result. But in 80s Russia, it was Adidas specifically that had a large increase in popularity, not sportswear in general. It's the same with StarCraft. It wasn't that RTS was a massive success, it's that Brood War was. Some claim that very few RTS games get released anymore, and this in itself is proof of the decline, but I think it's a bit of a blanket statement that has way too many exceptions for us to take at face value. First of all, games are generally supported for a lot longer than they used to be, which leaves less room for newer releases. StarCraft 2 still gets balance patches to this day, and retains hundreds of thousands of players, and Company of Heroes 2 was still supported for at least 7 years after its release, something that can't be said for most of the RTS titles of old. The sheer number of open source or community RTS projects is also good evidence for the existence of a strong fan base. Let us not also forget about the fact over the last three years we've had Command & Conquer Remastered, Warcraft 3 Reforged, Age of Empires 4 and Company Heroes 3, as well as a decent number of independent releases. You might not rate any of them very highly, but you can't deny their existence. Don't forget that we also have Stormgate, Zero Space and Homeworld 3 announced for the near future. The truth is a lot murkier than people like to make out, and in all likelihood, RTS has always been a bit of a niche. It doesn't help that these games don't often translate to consoles very well, which have always been a larger part of the video game market. I think one of the big problems is budgets. Games are a lot more expensive to make these days, and it can be more difficult to produce commercially viable products for smaller markets. This is why so many flop. They are created in the kind of culture that gave us Modern Warfare 2, where you can afford to spend $250 million to make and market a title because you'll know you'll get a billion dollars in return. I think that the secret to a successful RTS is narrowed goals and an economic use of development time. Do you really need 20 or 30 hours of movie quality CG cutscenes? Or 100 fully motion captured units? Probably not. Can you make a good game with a smaller budget? Well, I think so. And if you speak to any of the community teams that are producing great open source experiences, I think they'll agree with you. But if we were going to develop a full commercial product, how much should we spend? Well, let's look at the price of staffing a team. Salaries are wildly different all over the world, but we'll focus on the Western market, and we see that we could be paying $100,000 per annum for a developer. So, a million dollars gets us a team of 10 for a year, Probably a bit optimistic to create a great detailed game with such a small team in 12 months, so let's scale it up. Let's say we need a team of 50 for 3 years. Senior developers will cost us 100k to be sure, but other staff members such as testers may only cost us 50. So we'll sit on a 50-50 split between experienced and junior members at a total of $75,000 per staff member on average. This means that for just over $11 million, we'll get 50 people working on a game for 3 years. But we also want people to hear about our game, and we want somewhere for our staff to work and servers to play the game on, so let's double that for overheads and marketing. Awesome, we've done it, they've made us a game. But now we need to recoup that money, so let's sell the game at $50 a copy. We will need to sell 450,000 units to cover our $22 million investment. This might be tricky, but do we need 50 developers working for 3 years to make a good game? There are indications that perhaps not. Battlebit Remastered was created by 3 people, 
and that sold almost 2 million copies in its first couple of weeks. Among Us sold millions of copies, again with just 3 developers. RimWorld started with just one developer, and although a few others are now involved, it's made over $100 million in revenue. Now, you could write off the success of Among Us and say, hey, it's a simple game that only did so well because it was released at exactly the right time. But I don't think it would be fair to say that about Battlebit or RimWorld. But hey, let's scale up a little. Face Punch Studios, of Gary's Mod and Rust fame, is staffed by about 50 people, but has a yearly revenue north of $80 million. Now, these smaller teams aren't going to make sales figures akin to the next Battlefield, Call of Duty or GTA, but they don't need to. Their smaller teams and more modest marketing budgets mean they don't require anything near that magnitude to be profitable. And that means games that are in a bit more of a niche, like RTS, might still be workable if kept at a sensible level. The question is, does more money make a better game? I'm not sure, but let's look at the film industry as a comparison. In the 2010s, two films were released, a western, and I think we'll call the other a space western. Both of them had something strong going for them that would normally guarantee a certain level of ticket sales. One of them was created by a well-respected director, and the other one was part of one of the biggest franchises in cinematic history. They both took 400 million at the box office, but only one of them was a commercial success. Solo, a Star Wars story, stumbled over the line with a final budget of $300 million. It's often said that you need to double that budget on the box office to start making your money back, so when it only pulled in $400 million, it was an instant failure. Django Unchained was shepherded through the process by its creator, and with a budget of $100 million, it not only broke even, but netted a very tidy profit. I'm sure Tarantino could have spent $300 million on Django if he wanted to, but I doubt it would have been a better movie. With films, more spectacle and a bigger budget does not always result in a better product. You don't need a massive budget to make a good movie. Adjusting for inflation, the first Terminator film cost 20 million to make in today's money. The most recent one cost 200 million. I'll let you guess which one got better reviews and made a bigger profit. I wonder if the same is true in video game development today. I've got no way to be sure, but I've at least attempted to research the topic. One of the problems I've continually run up against writing this quasi ran is that it's so hard to actually get development costs and sales figures out of game companies. I found some sources that said Dawn of War 3 had a budget of $3.5 million, which was far lower than I was expecting, and makes me think that perhaps Company of Heroes 3 was actually a commercial success. I assumed it was a massive flop, but I've seen figures quoted that only between 1 in 20 and 1 in 50 people leave a review on Steam. So if we take the most pessimistic of those figures, multiply it by the 12,000 reviews it got, and then again by the $50 price tag, that's over $12 million. Enough to put a team of 50 on it for a couple of years at a minimum if you don't spend too much on marketing. Paradox reported that they had to write down $22 million of losses due to the poor reception of the Lamplighters League. Now, even if we assume they just wanted to break even, this would still push the game's budget north of $22 million, which seems very high. It was previously reported that Harebrain Studios were forced to lay off 80% of its staff in June, before the release of the game. If you look at its LinkedIn page now, it lists 30 employees, so if we do a quick bit of maths, it may have had 150 employees previously. It also finished its last Battletech DLC in 2019 and has released no other projects since, so that would mean that they've been working on the Lamplighters League for the last three years or so. If we plug in our 75k per employer average we had from earlier, multiply that by 150 people over three years, we get $33 million. A very rough figure to be sure, but it does look like something in the right ballpark that would explain why Paradox had to write off a $22 million loss and decided to sack so many employees. If you really think about that, it's quite interesting and does make me actually have a little sympathy for Paradox. It's even more interesting when you realise that the initial announcement for the game appeared about the same time as the mass layoffs. My initial knee-jerk reaction was that Harebrain was let down by their publisher, who gutted their studio and failed to correctly market the game, but now I'm not so sure. 
Could it be that Harebrain dragged their feet on the project, overspending and under-delivering every step of the way until Paradox finally decided to cut their losses and move on? I guess we'll never know, but hey, we can wildly speculate about it in the comments if you like. So, are RTS games commercially viable? Well, I think so. I don't think you're going to make $100 million on one, but if you've got a good idea for a game, the right team, and a sensible budget, then I think that success is totally possible. Hi, I'm Calivan, and thanks for sitting through this wild speculation. If you enjoyed my confused ramblings, please leave me a like. If you want more like this, give the subscribe button a go.